Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining the session today. I hope everyone is safe and sound. Um, so my name is Flavio. I am a, a senior director and senior distinguished engineer at Dow. I have been working on this project called Provega for the past few years with my colleagues at, um, in, in the team. And today I will be giving an introduction of Provega. I'll tell you a bit about what it is and, and, and its architecture, its core features. And then I'll focus on one specific problem, which is the one of, of ingesting data in with exactly one semantics using the some of the features and mechanisms that we expose in Profega. So that's the, the core of the presentation today. First, let me give you a few key points about Provega. Uh, I, I, want, I want you to remember some of these terms because I'll be talking about them in more detail across the talk. And these are some of the things I'd like you to remember after this presentation. So Provega is a, st a stream store is a storage system that exposes a stream as, as its main primitive. The architecture of Provega is based on the concept of, uh, or the abstraction of segments. And the reason why segments are interesting is because they enable us to flexibly compose streams and to implement some uh, very important features when it comes to uh, storing streams and embedding such storage in uh, in data pipelines, like scaling streams, uh, transactions, and even state replication. Provega is an open source project. Um, I have on slide two, um, two important URLs. One is our website, provega.io, and the other one is our Provega repository on GitHub. So if you're interested, uh, go visit and, uh, and check it out. In this talk, there will be, uh, in broad terms, four sections. One, the first one, I will cover data streams. I will, you know, I know perhaps a good chunk of, of the people, if not everyone in the audience um, knows what, a, or has some notion of what a data stream is, but I want us to be on the same page. So I'll talk a bit about data streams from, uh, from my perspective. Then I'll do an introduction of uh, Chupra Vega, including talking a bit about its architecture. Then I'll focus on the specific problem that I mentioned, which is the one of ingesting data in an exactly once manner to a Provega stream. And then uh, hopefully, if time allows, I'll, I'll give you some, uh, I'll give you a quick demo and, uh, and show you some, uh, some code. All right, so let's talk a bit about data streams. So when I think about data streams, what I'm referring to is um, data that is coming from sources that are continuously generating it. And it could be end users in, uh, in traditional applications uh, that you can think of, like social networks or users that are, that are doing you know, shopping online and they are uh, purchasing and there are online transactions. All those can generate a continuous flow of, uh, of events, which constitutes a, 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 an event stream. Um, or one or more event streams, but it's not only about end users. You can have machine generated data. I can have servers that are continuously emitting telemetry. I can have tools and services that I, we use on a daily basis, uh, Jira, Git, Jenkins, all those, all those uh, outputting messages um, continuously that we want to ingest and process and perhaps visualize. And then we have uh, another set, which is uh, a hot topic. It has been a hot topic for a few years. It re remains a hot topic and will continue to be given the, you know, the, the expansion of, the, of the, the space of applications that care about it, which is IoT, uh, and which is related to edge. And in those, you have maybe sensors, devices that are continuously emitting um, uh, Samples, uh, events, uh, could be, yeah, so it sends uh, samples, events, uh, continuously emitting data that you might want to, you might want to ingest and, uh, and process in various ways. You might want to, you might want to have a, a digital twins application in which you have a, um, a digital mirror of, of devices and group them and visualize in, uh, in different ways. So all those are examples of sources of continuously generated data and how those map to, uh, to, to the notion of, uh, of streams that I've been talking about. So the landscape that, uh, that we put Praveg into is this one in which we have uh, on the left-hand side, a you know, distinct sources of, uh, of continuously generated data. 
uh, as I mentioned, it could be end users, could be machine generated, uh, like um, sensors, uh, uh, connected cars, uh, servers, any of these things. We ingest that data and we process it. Now, processing it might require, uh, might require multiple steps. It's not necessarily ingesting the data, processing and be done. You can have multiple stages of, uh, of storing the data and processing the data and outputting and storing some more and processing it again. So you could have multiple stages of that. But the ultimate goal could be a number of things. Again, it could be visualizing the, the data that is being that is being generated uh, could be in its raw form. It could be um, different ways in which makes it more intuitive to understand what um, what what's happening in 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 a fleet of servers and set of devices. Um, it could be alerts about bad things that are happening in the system. It could be um, uh, it could be insights about about users, again, about devices, about the environment, uh, recommendations, uh, actionable insights. All those are valid outputs for uh, for such data pipelines. Now, when it comes to use cases that we have uh, that we have for Prevega, one one type of use case that we have been seeing quite frequently is the one of uh, of drones, which are emitting telemetry and uh, and video streams. So there are from drones. You're seeing a, a, at, at least two streams. Again, one of which is video, the other that is telemetry. You want to ingest that data. You want to process it, and and often you want to process the data as it's being generated. So you're essentially taping the stream, but also you want to process in retrospect. So perform historical processing over the data, data that has been ingested uh, some time back, and you want to go back and either reprocess it or perform some kind of historical processing from uh, fr from scratch. And the reason why uh, various companies want to do this are they go from uh, inspecting the, the health of uh, of your cattle to uh, airplanes in between in between flights looking for structural damage on a, on such airplanes so it, it varies uh, substantially another type of use case is the one of industrial iot where you have um where you have cameras you have sensors they are all emitting data continuously and again the, the principle of ingesting that data processing the, the fresh data and perhaps going back to the to the older data and perform historical processing is very appealing to uh, to a lot of these use cases so in industrial iot we have seen a number of um a number of uh, of, of use cases that also have such requirements Now, stepping back and thinking a bit more abstractly about uh, about data streams, let's um, let's talk about what are the what are some of the core properties that uh, we would like or we observe when talking about streams. So, the most intuitive way of thinking about a stream is uh, one sequence of, uh, of of events. As new events come in, you append those events to the to to, to that stream. So it has it has a head at the beginning of the stream and has a tail, which is where you are appending the the new events. But it's not as simple as that because we can have a fleet of servers, a fleet of a, a group of uh, of uh, of sensors, and all emitting samples at the same time. So a stream looks more like this, where we have a certain degree of uh, of parallelism. But it doesn't stop there either, because the tr the traffic can fluctuate. Traffic can fluctuate because of uh, of uh, daily cycles, weekly cycles, or regular cycles in the in the in the generation of data. Uh, they could be also uh, occasional spikes because you introduced more devices, you introduced more servers, uh, or maybe a, a chunk of them have been decommissioned or crashed. So all those could induce fluctuations in that uh, in that um, in that traffic, and so it's not just a constant, uh, a constant rate for the stream all the time. You could observe such fluctuation, load dropping, load increasing. The streams are also unbounded, right? so you can you can have a stream running for you know, for as long as you like. It's uh, we were talking about data that is being generated continuously, so it's going to be generated for as long as the sources are there. And ideally, we do not make a, a artificial split between the old data and, and the fresh data, which I'm going to call 
the lambda way in in reference to the to the lambda architecture. So ideally, we make no such a distinguish distinction between fresh and historical data. And when we expose the abstraction of the stream, uh, the stream encompasses all the data you need from it, uh, the, the historical part of it, and the, and the tail part of the of the of the stream. But all of that is about the right side of the stream, so appending to the stream, cr creating the stream. But also, we need when we think about a system that provides the ability to users. To, um, to to store such a stream, we also need to have, give the ability of uh, reading such a stream in a way that is uh, that uh, that is uh, not only convenient but it meets the requirements of uh, of applications. And so, if if we are to fluctuate the, the traffic and scale a stream, then we need on the right side we also need to provide that same capability on the on the read side. So in the end, if, if I group all those characteristics that I, I just mentioned, uh, go back to the notion of a stream and, and, and Provega, the key thing that we're trying to do with Provega is to provide a, a storage system that gives uh, properties that are not, not only are desirable from the perspective of, a, of an application performing stream analytics or uh, processing streams in, a, in general, but also that, uh, that those properties, they meet um, the characteristics of a cloud native application. So they provide the they provide the, the notion of unbounded data for a stream. So a stream can accommodate uh, as as much data as its uh, storage systems allow it. Uh, it's elastic, so it can fluctuate its its capacity according to the according to the incoming traffic. It's consistent. It provides semantics that allow allow it to be correct when you process the data. And it enables the, the, the applications both to tail the stream or process the fresh data and perform historical processing, the older data of, uh, of, uh, of data analytics of, um, of the stream. Uh, that's what I'm referring to when I say cloud native in the context of, uh, of storage for data streams. Let's now talk a bit about, about Provega. Remember I mentioned right in the beginning that one key concept in Provega is the one of a stream segment. A stream segment is a, a stream of bytes. It's an append-only data structure. We append bytes to it. Uh, note that I, I mentioned events many times, and now I'm talking about bytes. So in Provega, the segments, they do not store seg uh, events directly. They store. Uh, the bytes of the events, and to get to the bytes, we expect a serializer to be given so that uh, we can we can perform that transformation. Now, we, with segments, we we can provide parallelism, so we can have a number of uh, of segments in parallel. And from a writer perspective, we the writer uses routing keys to map an append to a given segment. And that's important because we provide per key order. Now, one thing that is interesting in Provega is that that parallelism, that degree of parallelism is not static. A stream in Provega can scale up and down. And so in this slide, I'm showing a representation of a stream that starts with uh, with two segments. Remember that I'm starting my stream from, a, from, from the right side, from the head. It starts with two segments, then scales up and and goes and becomes five, five segments, and then it scales down and becomes three. So this kind of dynamics um, is a, a feature that uh, that we provide in Provega, and uh, streams can scale that way according to a to a policy that um that is described when you create a stream. Another feature that we can provide with segments is transactions. So when an application comes and, and creates a transaction, what Provega does internally is to create temporary transaction segments. So the green segments on, a, on the slide correspond to the temporary transaction segments. It's temporary in the sense that uh, it only exists until the, the transaction commits or aborts. So all appends done to the transaction uh, while the transaction is open are going to go to those temporary transaction segments. And when the application decides to commit, then those transactions are merged to the main segments of the stream, in which case the data becomes 
uh, becomes available from that point onwards. Uh, or the application can decide to abort and the transaction segments are simply discarded. And in that case, uh, the data does not become visible at all. And while this transaction is ongoing, it does not block the data in the, in the, the mainstream segments. And finally, another interesting, um, another interesting feature that I'm going to use for the exactly one suggestion case is the one of, uh, of state synchronizers, persisting state in, in Prevega and in a way that I can be shared and synchronized across a set of processes. Uh, we do that by having a, a special feature of, uh, of, um, of streams, which is performing conditional appends. So we have this abstraction of a revision stream. And that revision stream is what the, the state synchronizer, which is again, this abstraction that gives you the ability of processing states across process uses. So state synchronizer builds on, a, on these revision streams and enables us to, um, to, uh, to update state in a consistent manner and share across processes if, uh, if needed. Let's now talk a bit about the, the Prevega architecture. Um, the, if, in Prevega, if you are ingesting data, you can, and, and you are ingesting using the event API, you use an event writer. So the application uses an event writer, one or more to append events to, um, to the stream. The, the Prevega tracks the writer position in the case that, uh, that we have these connections and we need to reconnect so that uh, the writer knows where to, to resume from. Then the application reads from, uh, from that stream using event readers. We group the event readers into reader groups and those readers split the load of, uh, of segments uh, uh, among them. And they use the state synchronizer to perform that, uh, that kind of coordination. So we can uh, add and, and remove readers as, as needed. So that gives us the ability of growing and shrinking uh, the capacity of a, of, a, of a reader group. And the readers work even the presence of, of stream scaling. Remember that I mentioned the stream scaling feature where the degree of, uh, of parallelism in a stream can change over time. So Prevega takes care of, of preserving the order of, uh, of segments that are, that are generated. And, and that, um, that assignment of, uh, of segments as they are created and, and they are sealed, that's performed internally by, uh, by the logic of, uh, well, by Provega and by the logic of, uh, of the reader group. So the reader groups work even in the presence of, uh, in pre preserve order, even in the presence of, uh, of auto scaling. We have, um, so th there, there is the, we implement the control plane and the data plane um, with the controller and the segment store. So the controller is the component that is responsible for the life cycle of streams. It takes requests to create a stream, to delete a stream, and also takes care of, uh, of transactions. So if, uh, if an application creates a transaction, appends to it, and then commits, the controller will be responsible for performing the merges. And the segment store is unaware of, uh, of streams. The segment store only deals with the life cycle of, um, of segments stores the, the, the segment data, it performs merges, create segments, delete segments as needed. Now, both the controller and the segment store are stateless. They, they keep states in, uh, in a storage tier, which has uh, three main components. Uh, we use Zookeeper for some uh, coordination tasks. We do not use Zookeeper for metadata. So the the we, we do not rely on Zookeeper for metadata that uh, that can grow without bounds. So as we add new streams, uh, the state that is kept in Zookeeper does not does not grow accordingly. Now in the segment store, we rely on on both Bookkeeper uh, for what we for for our journals. So as data come in, we store data in uh, in journal for uh, for for the sorry in Bookkeeper ledgers uh, for durability. And we asynchronously flush the data to long-term storage. We can be implemented with file or object. We give different options for that long-term storage. Inside the segment store, we have the concept of, um, of segment containers. The segment container is 
it is not to be confused with the Linux containers, is a grouping of, of segments and it's the units we use uh, of work assignment across segment store instances. So given the set of, uh, of uh, segment containers in the system, uh, the controller will be responsible for assigning all those segment cont containers across the, the segment store instances. And this is the next point that I want to quickly touch upon. So the controller uh, knows the segment, uh, the segment containers that are, that are in the system, and and the, it assigns the existing segment containers to the to the existing segment store instances. And in the case say that uh, we add a new segment store instance, the controller will be responsible for performing the the reassignment, so that it balances the load across the the existing segment stores. Now, looking at the write and the read path, let's look more closely and see what's going on. So on the write path, an event stream writer, if he wants to append events, then he first will talk to the controller and see which segment store is supposed to connect to. Once it does it, it will connect to the segment store and start appending bytes. Um, the segment store won't acknowledge to the event writer uh, until it has persisted in Apache Bookkeeper. And once it does, it can acknowledge. Um, but the data is not immediately written to long-term storage. That data is asynchronously flushed to, uh, to that tiered storage. So Apache Bookkeeper is there to guarantee durability. We, we use it because we want to guarantee low latency in the presence of, uh, of small writes. Uh, but then we rely on long-term storage to keep data for, uh, for for longer period of, periods of time. Remember that one of our goals is to uh, store an unbounded amount of data per, per string. And for that, we have, again, different options. It can be based on file or object, and this is configurable at, at the at deployment time. For the read path, uh, we it's similar. The event stream reader needs to contact the controller to know which segment store to talk to. Um, the segment store has a cache where it, it keeps the data that uh, that is supposed to flush to uh, to long-term storage, and that's considered to be the the tail of uh, of the streams or of the segments that, uh, that that is managing for the segment containers it has assigned to it. And so when an event stream reader submits a request to read data from Okay, something have something happened to my to my um, to my headset. I don't know if uh, if I'm audible. Um, okay, so sorry. Let me go back. All right. So let's talk about the read path. So on the read path again, you, the event stream reader contacts the, the controller. Then it talks to the to the segment store, request data from the segment store. If it has in it in the cache, it's going to return from the cache. And this is supposed. This is expected to happen in the case that uh, the reader is tailing the the stream. If not, if it's a cache miss, then we'll, you read data from uh, from long term storage and uh, and populate the cache and we'll serve from there. Note that um, we we never serve reads from Apache Bookkeeper today. So that data in Bookkeeper is used only upon recovery. So for example, when we move a segment container to a different segment store, uh, or when the segment store, uh, give us given segment store instance um, restarts a, a segment container, it can repopulate the cache with, uh, with uh, or, and its metadata from the Apache Bookkeeper ledgers. Okay, so that was an overview of, uh, of Provega. So remember that I talked a bit about data streams and uh, and some core properties. Uh, then I covered Provega. I talked about some of the core features, and then I, I talked a bit about the architecture of Provega. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about one concrete problem, which is the one of uh, ingesting data in a, in an exactly one's manner to a Provega stream. So the setup looks like this. 
I have a data source, which can be a number of things. It can be an end user. It can be, again, a server. It can be a sensor. It can be uh, even Pravig itself uh, or files uh, in, a, in a file system. I have an application that is receiving this data or is, is reading this data, and it's using an event writer to append data to a Pravega stream. So that's that's the, the, the setup. Now, there are a couple of, uh, in broad terms, two, source, two, two data source types that, are, that we care about. Uh, and I'm going to call them memoryless and memoryful. So memoryless are the sources that are not capable of retransmitting events. So they produce the events, they emit it, and they forget about it. There is no buffering. There is no, 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 no caching. There is uh, no persistent store. Right, so we cannot guarantee exactly one semantics for such sources in the process of process crashes. So we'll see what we can do. And one example would be stateless sensors that again emit samples and do not um, uh, and do not keep them. And then there's the memory full version of it, which are data sources that are capable of retransmitting from any given offset. So from a position uh, that you can refer to. Uh, of course, you might not be able to arbitrarily go back in time. So that's probably that's possibly bounded, but from uh, for, uh, for all practical purposes, it uh, you should be able to re to resume from any point that uh, that you need to. So that's the assumption we're making for such data sources. Many examples would be uh, would be files or uh, or Pravega streams. All right, so memoryless sources. So for memoryless sources, um, let's say a sample, uh, a sensor. So it emits three samples. The application starts receiving them and appending them to a, to a Pravega stream. So the application uh, takes blue and red and, uh, and makes a request to append them. Now, let's say that uh, the connection breaks at that point, right? So what happened to the events? What has gone through and what has not gone through? So to deal with that, uh, we, we do the following. And, here are four steps that, uh, that uh, I, I want to show in this slide. So the first step is uh, the writer appending the blue events. There is, internally, there is a notion of a writer ID, and the segment store keeps a mapping of the writer ID to the event that has been successfully appended. So when blue is successfully appended, uh, it sets the event number to one and acknowledges back to the reader. Now, in, uh, in, in step two, the writer uh, submits the red event, but the connection breaks at, at that point, and he doesn't know if the red event has gone through or not. Uh, it happens that he has gone through. The segment store uh, has a record of it, but the writer doesn't know. So, so in that case, uh, what the writer is going to do is is going to start a new connection. As part of that, you have you do a handshake with the segment store, and you you tell its writer ID. The segment store will send back the last event that has been written. Now, the writer knows that uh, the red event has been written, so he moves to the black event and, uh, and, uh, and submits the black event to, uh, to, to be appended. And now it's acknowledged, the, the, the application is good to go, right? So the application has appended everything that, uh, that he needed. Now, what happens if instead of the connection breaking, the application crashes? So in that case, um, the application can res can restart, but it doesn't have a way of uh, of getting the the it doesn't have a way of determining what has been written. It doesn't have a way of uh, of getting from the sensor what's missing. So the sensor can retransmit by by design. So let's look at what we can do with memory memoryful sources now, uh, because we can do some interesting things there. So with memory full sources, let's assume that such a source is capable of rewinding. So it's based on some notion of, a, of, of offset. A simple example of such a source would be uh, a set of files that we want to ingest in, uh, in order. And the offset can be a file name and a file name and a, an, off, an offset for that file. Uh, there could be more complex uh, examples of such a source. It could be, uh, say, a flink job where uh, an offset could be a, uh, a, um, a job snapshot. For the sake of example, in this presentation, I'll focus on, um, on files as a data source, OK? Files as a, as a data source, uh, the application starts reading, 
it, it reads the first two events, blue um, and reds. It appends them, and then the application crashes. Right. So the question is, which events have been successfully appended to the to the stream? So the application doesn't know. So what we can do here is to introduce transactions. So in the way we introduce transactions, um, the application creates a transaction before it appends anything. Inside Provega, when it creates a transaction, it will Provega will create the transaction segments as I have described before. Then it will append events to the transaction. Um, the and, and once it has done it, it commits the transaction. And now all events become available as part of, uh, of the mainstream. Then for the remaining events, it creates a new transaction. It appends the remaining events. It commits the transaction, and now we're done. So we have covered the, the, the whole file, right? And append all the, the, the corresponding events. But now, what happens if the application crashes in the middle of a transaction? So before an application has the chance of, uh, of, uh, of committing it. So let's say that we're in the situation that we committed the first transaction, but we, ha we haven't committed uh, the second transaction and then the application crashes. So how does it know uh, up to what offset has been successfully committed? Um, it, it doesn't, right? So it needs some state to determine uh, where, where where the application was and, uh, and even if there is a, an outstanding transaction. So that's where we introduce the state synchronizer. So the state synchronizer is an abstraction available as part of the client API. It enables the coordination of state across process uh, when I say process, um, you know, it can be application instances. We do use it internally as part of our reader groups to coordinate the actions of uh, of the readers in a in a reader group. But again, it's also exposed through the API, and applications can use it. The processes that that use a state synchronizer, they can update state conditionally, and they can read state updates to update the, their um, their local state. In our case, in, in our application, in this example, uh, it will persist states using the state synchronizer interface. And the state is a simple pair um, of starting file offset, offset and transaction ID. So now the application will create a, a transaction before it does anything. It will update the state in the synchronizer saying, you know, I'm, I'm at offset zero of the file and I have a start transaction ID with, uh, with this ID. And then you will perform the, the appends. And then we'll commit the transaction. And for the remaining events, it will create a new transaction, update the state of the synchronizer, update the events, and then commit the transaction. And now what happens if the application crashes before committing the transaction? So if the application crashes before committing the transaction, so now we have a transaction open, the events have been appended, but the trans transaction is open. Uh, the application will read, it will recover, and as part of that recovery, it will read the state of, uh, of the state synchronizer. It will determine that, uh, it will check the status of transaction with, uh, because it has the, the transaction ID. It will check the, the, the status of the transaction against Provega. It will tell Provega to abort the transaction and it will start it over. So it will create a transaction, append the, the state of the synchronizer, append the, the, the remaining events, and then commit the transaction. And now our job is, um, is done for, for that file. Okay, so now I wanted to give a quick, talk a bit about code and give a quick demo. Um, so the simple code that I have to show, so you have the URL in the, at, at, the bottom of a, at the bottom right of the slide. And what this code does is the following. Uh, in, in broad terms, it iterates over a set of simple files, uh, and we perform one transaction per file to simplify it. Uh, there's no bound in the amount of data in a transaction, so it, it, it doesn't matter the size of the file, even though this can be calibrated. Uh, if it's, if it's uh, small enough, then uh, Though doing one file per transaction is, uh, is, is perfectly reasonable. And we commit once, once all the events have been written. Then it's simple code also implements uh, a state synchronizer 
upon creating a new transaction, it updates the synchronized state. The state is a single value, an instance of status, where status is a, is a pair, file ID, transaction ID. Upon recovery, it fetches the latest status, aboard any outstanding transaction, and, and it sets the, the start file. This is how the stream initialization look like. There are two streams, one stream for the state synchronizer uh, and one for the data stream. Now, note that uh, we have, we are setting the scaling policy for both streams. Uh, in this case, we don't care about the auto scaling. And so we are just setting a, a fixed number of segments. So one for the state synchronizer because we don't need more. And uh, actually you can't use more. And, uh, and for the data stream, we're setting uh, a fixed number of, uh, of 10 segments. Then we iterate over the files. So given the list of files, uh, for each file, uh, for each file, we begin a transaction. We update the state of, uh, of the state synchronizer with the file ID and, um, and the transaction ID. Note that uh, if we are recovering, you know, if this is a restart and we're recovering, then, uh, then this is going to skip uh, some files. And, and now, once we start a file, we write the events of a file to the transaction, and then we commit it. Implementing the, synchronize, the synchronizer is, is also simple. We need to define what the state is. Uh, the state, I'm calling it updatable status here. Then we need to define what is the initial state and, and how it performs state updates. And all those are uh, defined in those uh, in those three classes. And then we have access methods that I, that that's what is we expose to the applications, how the application interacts with uh, with the synchronizer class. For recovery, once we once the application starts, it gets the state of the synchronizer. It will check the status of uh, of the outstanding transaction. If it's still open, then the application aborts it. If it's aborting, then uh, then uh, it, it let it be. It uh, it, um, it it starts from uh, from the given file ID because it assumes that uh, it hasn't been done yet. Now, if it's committed, then it moves to the to the um, to the next file. Aborting the transaction, as in the open case, is not strictly necessary because Provega would eventually time out and and uh, and uh, remove it. But it's good practice to uh, remove any data that uh, that is unnecessary. So now I want to give a demo of the approach that I have described, and I want to show the flow of the of the sample code that I I've just talked about. So let me talk a bit about the demo setup first. I will I will have uh, a bunch of pre-created input files. Uh, specifically, I'll have 50 files. Uh, each, files uh, each file has uh, 1,000 samples. Uh, each sample is another object representing a, a simple event that has three fields. Then I will ingest the content of those files into a Pravega stream using the technique I have just I have described using transactions and a, and a state synchronizer. And then I'll use a, a Flink job just to check the state of, uh, of the stream and, and visualize it through, uh, through the dashboard. So let's go, let's go watch the demo. Let's first check that uh, all the files are there so that we can ingest them into a Provega stream. So all the files are there. As I mentioned, they have been pre-generated. Now, the next step is to start Provega standalone. I will start Provega standalone and leave it running in the in the background. And then the next step is to run the process that is going to read from the files and ingest it. Because it's going to be using transactions, we'll see messages in the output, making references to the transactions it's creating uh, and committing. Now, this is going to be using one transaction per file. So it will read the content of a file write in as part of a transaction and then commit it. So again, we'll see one transaction per file. So let's get it to run. Uh, we should shortly start seeing it. Uh, it's starting the transactions. All right, so it's starting the first transaction. Um, I have slowed down the, the 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 transactions so that we can see the output. Otherwise, it would go too fast. Uh, so it's going 
as I mentioned, one, one file at a time. Now let's let's break this, let's break the flow uh, so that we see what happens. So if we break the flow, what should happen is, uh, because I, I'm trying to ingest it in exactly one manner, I don't want to repeat data. I don't want to have duplicates of, uh, of data that I, I have already ingested. So it should, rec it should from the state um, of the application, determine what is the next transaction or the next file to start from. So because it committed, um, it committed up to nine, we would expect it to start at, uh, at 10. If nine really committed, it should start at 10. So it's either nine or 10, depending on the on the current state. So let's see how, it yes, it starts from 10 uh, and you can keep it going, it keeps going. So let, let's do a few more and, uh, and repeat it. So let's control C again. Let's resume again. See where it starts from. So it should again skip the files that it has already ingested, and uh, and resume from the one that uh, it has it hasn't really committed. So it correctly it starts from seventeen. So now let's see the state of the stream. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll do that using a Flink job. So let's start a local Flink cluster. and start a reader to read the content of the stream. Let's see that in the... in the dashboard. Okay, so the job has started. Uh, we should eventually see, we should eventually see the job um, reading the, the whole 50,000 events that are supposed to be in the stream. Yes, so it, it, it updated up to 50,000 events. That's the, the exact number that we expect to see because again, we have 50,000, 1,000 events per file. Uh, that adds up to, um, to a total of, uh, of, of 50,000. So it has no duplicates, it didn't miss anything. So this is what we, we wanted to show. Now let's go back to the, to the presentation. One aspect I haven't, I haven't covered in the demo, but it's very, very important if we're talking about running this in production is concurrency. So let's say that the process data is, is supposed to ingest crashes and we want to finish the job. So we would start a new a new process. But in distributed systems, you never really know if things are just slow or they crashed. So it could it could happen that uh, we have we start a new writer, but there's the old one is still still is still there. And in such cases we could end up having duplicates. You have two processes reading from the same file starting a transaction and, and committing it. So we would need to change the logic in the in the in the uh, in our program to do that, and that's possible because again of the condition updates that we're able to do through the the state synchronizer that would avoid uh, duplicates. Uh, with respect to making sure that uh, we read all the content and we just saw the content, there are two parts to it. One is the logic is such that uh, no writer skips files, so it has it follows the sorted order of files, so it guarantees that uh, it goes through everything. If, if it finishes, um, but, but also we need to guarantee that it finishes, in which case we need to use some mechanism for uh, electing a leader, let's say, so some form of, uh, of leader selection. That will guarantee that uh, we ingest all, the, all the, the content we are interested in. One last topic to, to, to close the presentation is uh, exactly once at end to end. So I have discussed in this presentation exactly one semantics for ingestion, but clearly an application is interested in exactly, in exactly applications are interested in exactly one semantics end to end, not only the, the ingestion. I have covered in former presentations, the mechanisms to do it, but let's recap here just so that we have, uh, we have the full picture. So if we, if we use the scheme here to ingest in an exactly one manner using transactions and synchronizers, um, now we want, 
to have a pipeline where we read data from Pravega and, uh, and we end up outputting to Pravega again, we can use checkpoints at the source and uh, transactions at the sink to implement a mechanism that guarantees exactly one end to end. So applications can do it, or they can use, say, stream processors, which implement that for you. So if you write a job in, say, Apache Flink, that, uh, and, and it's using Vega as a source and as a sync, you would be able to use such uh, such features from Provega and such mechanisms. So in Flink, you have this implementation of a two-phase commit protocol. And the way this works with uh, with Provega is by is by having the master initiating a checkpoint and requesting a checkpoint from Provega, then running the, the distributed snapshotting algorithm that Flink implements. And when the, the snapshot completes, the transactions that, at the sync are able to commit and make the, the output uh, available. So that's that's roughly how this uh, how this works. I'm now ready to wrap up. So in conclusion, what I have covered today is I, I have started describing Provega. Provega is a storage system for streams. It's one of its main abilities is to provide um, applications with uh, with an a with APIs to read fresh data with low latency and also go back in time and uh, and process historical so process historical data of a, of a stream. It builds on the concept of segments. Um, segments enable a number of, of interesting features. Uh, we have discussed you know, transactions. Uh, th there is auto scaling. Um, um, even state synchronizers. So all those come from the fact that we build on this, this foundation of, uh, of segments. And Provega is an open source project. We are currently hosted on a, hosting the, the source code on, uh, on GitHub. One specific problem that I have covered, which is very important for applications that require strong, strong consistency guarantees is the one of uh, ingest ingesting data in an exactly once manner. So I have described how to use transactions and the state synchronizer in Provega to achieve that goal. But of course, just ingesting is not sufficient. So I have also uh, briefly touched upon how to, uh, to obtain exactly once end-to-end, -end, describing some, um, some um, earlier mechanisms that I, I have talked about in other, um, in other presentations, using checkpoint and transactions to, uh, for exactly once end-to-end. This is actually implemented in Apache Flink. So if you're an Apache Flink user, you can uh, have exactly one sent to end using Provega and Flink. This uh, this is a, a list of, uh, I wanna leave with, uh, with a list of resources, links to various things that I have covered throughout the talk, the Provega website, uh, the GitHub, uh, the Flink connector, and uh, the sample code for the demo I have shown today. So thank you.